Good morning. Welcome to today's video. I'll be telling you about associations. Now, basically, in an ecosystem, organisms would not live independently of the others. In some way, they end up interacting with other organisms around them. These interactions can take different forms, but we are mainly interested, I mean, for today's class, we are mainly interested in those um, interactions that have to do with food, obtaining food, all right? So interactions of those sort, we refer to them in some instances as feeding associations. So basically in biology, when we talk about associations, yes, we're talking about feeding relationships. Now the common associations we have in biology are three. Predation, saprophytism, also called saprotrophism, that's the broad term, and then symbiosis. Now, for symbiosis, there are three subtypes. We have parasitism, commensalism, and mutualism. So, very briefly, what do these terms mean? Predation. Predation is um, an association that occurs usually between two animals where one animal um, chases the other animal, as it were, catches it and consumes it for food. Now, the animal that um, is chased and that is consumed is referred to as the prey. And then the one that consumes it is referred to as the predator. So in predation, we have two organisms. One of them is called the predator and the other one is called the prey. So we can say that predation is a predator-prey relationship. So imagine, for example, that a lion chases an antelope, catches it and consumes it. The lion is the predator and the antelope the prey. What about snakes that ambush other animals? A snake could ambush a rat, for example, as you see it on National Geographic. Um, not your world, some of you watch that. Now, when this snake ambushes the rat, as the rat comes, what do you find? The snake would um, attack it, kill it, and consume it. In that case, the snake is the predator and the rat is the prey. So that's about predation. Two animals, doesn't involve plants. For saprophytism, a saprophyte is an organism that feeds on dead, decaying organic matter. Now, this saprophyte, the dead decaying organic matter they feed on, we refer to it as detritus. And because we said this organism feeds on dead decaying organic matter, it means that saprophytism involves only one living organism, not more than one. And there's this past question that says, which of the following feeding associations involves only one living organism? The answer would be saprophytism or saprotrophism, like I said, which is the umbrella term, all right? So examples of saprophytes, examples of organisms that feed on dead organic matter would be things like bacteria, some bacteria, um, fungi, earthworms, and um, you also have the dung beetle. All of these are saprophytes. They feed on dead organic matter, which is detritus. Now for symbiosis, sim together, bios, life, symbiosis, when you have organisms that practically live together, they live together to what end? Well, it depends on the type of symbiosis. Now, I'm going to use symbols to describe these three forms of symbiosis. See what we have? Parasitism, I'll say that is a plus-minus relationship. Commensalism is a plus-zero relationship. Mutualism is plus-plus. Now, what does plus mean? Plus means that an organism benefits, all right? Minus, an organism suffers harm. And then zero, an organism is unaffected. So it means that in parasitism, one organism benefits while the other suffers harm. In commensalism, one, other, um, one organism benefits while the other is unaffected, doesn't benefit and is unharmed as well. Then for mutualism, both organisms benefit. Now, in the case of um, the parasitism, the first one, the organism that benefits is called the parasite, then the other organism is called the host. So the parasite benefits, but the host loses. Now these parasites, some of them stay outside the body, we call them ectoparasites, things like um, leeches, things like mites, like um, lice, uh, what else, ticks, they're examples of 
ectoparasites, even plant parasites. Yes, some plants are parasites. They are also ectoparasites. You have plants like um, dodder. The dodder plant is a parasite. You have mistletoe. Mistletoe is also called loranthus. And then you also have um, a plant like the witch weed. Witch weed. That's also an example of plant that is parasitic. Then for the endoparasite, you think of the worms. Yeah, there are different worms that are endoparasites. You have the round worms, hook worm, pin worm, thread worm, even the flukes. Remember that flukes are flat worms, like the tape worm is a flat worm. So flukes, blood fluke, liver fluke, they are also worms and they are endoparasites. Now for commensalism, we said before that the organism that benefits is called the commensal and the other organism is called the host. If you were to take a typical example, imagine that you were on your way to church and then while you're at the bus stop, your pastor comes, he's also going to church and he takes you on a ride, gives you a free ride to church. That way you don't spend money on transport again. He has saved you money. You have benefited. But has he benefited? No. Has he lost? No, because he would have spent the same amount on petrol. I don't know if you understand me now. So that's commensalism. He is unaffected, but you have benefited. But bringing it to biology, we can have one example in the shark and remora relationship. Shark and remora. The remora is a small fish that clings to the shark. It holds on to the shark. It has a hold fast, which is um, its dorsal fin. It uses its dorsal fin to hold on to the shark. And move with it and as the shark feeds any debris any waste material no particles that drop off from the shark the remora feeds on all right so that way the remora gets free transportation free feeding but what about the shark it's unaffected because the remora does not take directly from its food all right it is the debris the waste that falls off that the remora feeds on so remora benefits but the shark is unaffected then um, you could also have cattle cattle and um, egret the egret is the white bird that strolls around with cattle now as cattle graze what do we find they disturb the grass and as they disturb the grass flying insects begin to pop up from wherever they are hidden and the egrets get food easily now without the cattle hunting would have been very difficult for the egrets but the cattle makes it easy now remember, the cattle is unaffected because the insects that the egret feeds on are not the things the cattle wants. The cattle has grass, it feeds on its grass, but in the process of feeding on grass, it makes life easier for the egret. So the egret benefits and the cattle is unaffected. But this must not be confused with this other relationship, cattle and oxpecker. There's um, a particular bird called the oxpecker. What this bird does when it goes around with cattle is to help it remove ticks from its body. So by removing ticks from the cattle, it gives the cattle good health because ordinarily those ticks could um, suck the blood of the cattle so much so that the cattle could um, die as a result, you understand? But with, with the oxpecker going around with it to remove these ticks, the cattle enjoys good health. Now, in the case of the oxpecker, by collecting those ticks and eating them, it gets food. So, in that case, they both benefit. And that means while cattle and egret relationship is commensalism, cattle and oxpecker relationship would be mutualism. So, mutualism, both organisms benefit. And we have one example already in these two organisms. Another example for mutualism would be um, the lichen. There's an organism called the lichen. Actually, it's not one organism, it's a dual organism, two organisms in one. So in the lichen, you have an alga and you have a fungus. They live together as one unit called the lichen. So the alga being photosynthetic can make food, then the fungus can provide protection. So it's more like you scratch my back and I scratch yours. Then you also have rhizobium. Rhizobium is a bacterium that helps to fix nitrogen for legumes. So we say rhizobium in the root nodules of legumes. All right? Rhizobium in the root nodules of legumes. That's another example. Then we also have gut bacteria. That is the bacteria that we find in the digestive system of um, herbivores. When herbivores feed on grass, these bacteria can help them digest the, um, the grass they feed on. 
but of course the bacteria get free um, housing as it were they stay inside the host digestive system and they are protected from the harsh environment on the outside just as these ones to get protection and they get food from the legumes that they fix nitrogen for but one last example i will give you would be this one insect pollinators and flowers or plants yeah the plants when insect pollinators visit plants it's to feed on nectar so they go from plant to plant feeding on nectar that's their benefit but in the course of doing so they end up transporting pollen grains from plant to plant that's the benefit of the plant in that case so that's another example of symbiosis precisely mutualism so those are feeding associations i'll see us in the next videos